Well, I think originally I kind of thought of acting as a wonderful escape and all of that. And then uh, as I went more deeply into my work, you know, as an actor, I realized that it was an expression of who I was. I come from Westport, Connecticut, hugely creative, wildly charismatic town. Nobody really talked about feelings. I didn't know what to say to people. I was extremely uncomfortable. That's why I guess acting on one level was a good thing because you know what the beginning, the middle, and the end of, of the play is going to be. I had no idea what any beginning, middle, or end of anything was going to be. And of course, when you drink, uh, you, you never have any idea. You, you don't. Dad was a kind of goofy, wonderful, a drinker. He was funny, he was charming, he was charismatic. My mother's drinking was much more obvious to us than my, than my dad's drinking. My mother was a kind of drinker who would drink one or two glasses and her personality would completely change. I had no idea who my mother was. He had started getting fired. Apparently it was because of his drinking and I didn't really know what was happening. I just knew that my family was disintegrating. He ended up absolutely catatonic. I had never seen anything like it in my life. He sat in a corner in a chair like this, and he wouldn't move, he wouldn't talk. Dad called me into his room, ah, and he said, uh, honey, uh, I can't find my glasses. And I looked underneath his uh, sheet, and they were right there. And I thought, something's not right here. In about five minutes, we heard a gunshot. That was the, the, ex, the, the event that would change my life forever. I didn't know what the hell had hit me. And I, we knew nothing in those days about post-traumatic stress syndrome. My mother was a, was a very different story. She struggled with a tremendous sense of emptiness, I think, of not having been nourished. A lot of that had to do with my grandfather, who um, believed in that and was a teacher and was on the radio all the time. And uh, he had uh, created a school of psychology called behaviorism, uh, the basis of which was don't hold your children, don't hug them. And I think that she was suicidal all of her life. I think there was a part of my mother that never wanted to live. I was away for the evening and I knew something was happening and I came back and my mother was really almost dead. She had t tried to take her own life. That was two weeks after dad did. So my parents struggled with their demons and neither one of them could label them. They didn't know what they were. And I think my father was definitely bipolar. And I think my mother could either have been that or she had a borderline personality. The problem with that when people are drinking is that as the adult child of two alcoholics, you are defending against their defense against mental illness. After dad died, I worked constantly. I was doing nothing but westerns, so I was doing all the bonanzas and the gun smokes, and I would hear nothing but gunshots. And, uh, you know, again, I had no idea why I would be, end up in a corner, you know, at a fetal position and panicked and shaking, and nobody knew about my dad's suicide, nobody. I, even my mother had sworn me to secrecy. She didn't want anybody knowing that that's how he passed. It's an interesting thing about suicide. There's still such stigma about it, and there's still such shame attached to it. It has a nasty smell, almost. People don't like the word. You can see what happens to them and to their bodies and to their faces when you mention the word, and they're frightened to talk about it. Obviously, after my dad died, and I tried to live through that, I was drinking by myself. I was very, I had tremendous shame about drinking. I knew that I needed help, uh, and uh, I, I had an agent uh, whose wife I knew was in the program, and I called him and she took me to a meeting. After being sober for like seven years then was when my mental illness really hit me, uh, and that was after my divorce. I didn't realize until the divorce how much of, a, of an edifice I had built around me to help control my own demons. I, I became suicidal. And um, I, I finally found a doctor. They don't know what to ask, and we don't know what to say. 
We need to go into those doctors with our history intact if we can, or you're gonna be misdiagnosed, and that's what happened to me. I was offered a movie called Silence of the Heart. Uh, John Avnet, Steve Tisch, it was a pretty wonderful group of people. Um, Chad Lowe. I played the mother of Chad, who was a deeply troubled teenager who ultimately took his own life. I had never dealt with this, really. I thought, you know what, I've got to do research on this. I got in touch with two wonderful people who were terrified. And we sat in my garden, and I asked them questions. Everything that I had experienced because of my father's death and the way he, he passed with a gun, they had experienced with their son. I cannot express what happened that night. It was literally an epiphany. It was literally as if, uh, you know, the scales fell from my eyes. It was biblical. And from that point on, after I did, after I did the movie, my life became committed to helping other people heal. Gradually, I, I kind of went toward the cliff to say, okay, where am I supposed to be in this movement? Somehow I got a phone call that said, um, would you mind if we came to your house, a group of survivors, a group of suicidologists, very well-known psychiatrists, pediatric psychiatrists, there had to be 10 people there. We're trying to start a foundation called the American Foundation of Suicide Prevention, and we need funding. And we have now about 52 chapters all over the country. We, we've raised close to five or six million dollars this year alone. We see our lives changing. Well, maybe it's perfect just the way it is. My life is very quiet today. And it's, I kind of walk around the house and I say, hmm, what should I do to make it busy? And maybe it's just sitting and meditating. Maybe it's just going over to my grandson's house, if I still can do that, and I can, thank God. Calling friends and finding out how they are. And all of those things have helped me unhook from the idea that uh, I can't get out of depression. My great high point recently has been learning how not to expect things, you know, and, and meeting my current husband, who's just, one of the greatest men I've ever met. I was in a class, which actually I'm teaching now, called self-mastery. <laughs> like I know something about that. One of the things that we had to do at the end of the class was to write um, a list. The top of my list was a sense of humor. The second one was passionate, uh, capable of giving and receiving love, self-supporting through his own contributions. I was at a Screen Actors Guild meeting. I saw this guy with his, he was sitting and his head was just barely above the table. <laughs> and he had great gray hair and beautiful blue eyes and glasses. We have not been separated since that time. And we keep laughing, we keep laughing. There's a wonderful poem by Emily Dickinson, who's my favorite poet. Uh, Hope is a thing with feathers that flutters in the soul. And I think for me, it is. It's not lasting, necessarily, but it's there. A hope kind of flutters. I think it's absolutely essential for, for life.